The King, the Demon, and the Smith. Once, long ago in Persia, there lived a king, whose name was Jamshed. During his reign, the Persian Empire was rich and prosperous. The most beautiful palaces were built and decorated with splendid carvings. Marvelous gardens and parks were laid out, where fountains splashed and roses spread their sweet fragrance. Tailors made expensive garments from cloths interwoven with gold thread. Goldsmiths fashioned clever ornaments and crusted with sparkling precious stones. The Persian weavers and smiths had learned these arts from the mysterious Devi, a people who had been conquered by King Jamshay. That great victory over the Devi had made the Persian king far too proud. He looked on himself as equal with the gods and he wanted his subjects to worship him as a god. Seated on his high golden throne, which was inlaid with dazzling jewels and had a back carved in the form of two peacock tails, he looked down heartily on his subjects, toiling at their work. The gods, who had once helped him to gain power, were now terribly angry when they saw how Jamshay, a mere mortal, dared to think he was equal to them. He would have to be punished. In Jamshay's time, there was a king reigning in Arabia whose eldest son was called Dahak. This young man was not only handsome, but clever. He did all he could to gain as much knowledge as was possible. He wanted to be able to rule as wisely as his father, the king, when the time came for him to ascend the throne. Now, Unknown to the Huck, the angry gods had decided to make use of him to break the power of proud Jimshade. It was not long before the Devi, the people who had been conquered by Jimshade, knew what it was the gods had in mind. The leader of the Devi, a demon by the name of Iblis, had at his command the most tremendous magic powers. Now, he saw a way of dealing the hated Persian overlord a mighty blow. Iblis, who could not be harmed so long as he was in favor with the gods and doing what they wanted, was now quite beside himself with glee as he planned the downfall of Jamshed. His mind had been filled with nothing but thoughts of revenge ever since that king had defeated his people. While Iblis was working on his plans, his great peals of laughter rang so horribly through his palace that the black crows in the towers flew up cawing in alarm and the rats crept away into the farthest corners of the damp cellars. Down with the Persians, down with Jamshed, roared Iblis, and as his voice echoed a hundred times along the corridors, the servants huddled together and asked one another what dreadful plans their master could be hatching. When, some time later, Iblis arrived at the court of the king of Arabia, he showed no sign of what he had been doing. He had taken on the form of a young scholar who had been drawn by the fame of the king's studious son and had come to meet him and talk with him. 
Prince Dahak was delighted to meet the young scholar. He ordered his servants to make a room ready for Iblis so that they would be able to study together. The king too was pleased with the idea. He had often wondered whether his son was making himself lonely by shutting himself away the whole time. There were very few young men at the court who wanted to live in such a serious way as the prince, who liked nothing better than studying and allowed himself no time for enjoyment. Now, Dahak would be able to talk with the young scholar about things that interested him without feeling that what he was saying was just going over the other person's head. In the past, this had often happened when he talked with courtiers, who listened politely to what the prince was saying, but never understood a word of it. Well pleased with the way things were going, Iblis moved into the room that the Hux servants had made ready for him. The room was on the first floor of the palace, next to the prince's rooms. The floor of the room was covered with costly carpets and on the walls hung tapestries with fantastic patterns in many colors. On a low table, there was a lamp. Its oil spread a lovely scent that mingled with the fragrant smell of the grapes, peaches, and pomegranates in the brass bell that stood next to the lamp. Everything is going according to my plan, thought he pleased to himself, and a devilish light glowed in his eyes for a moment. But, it had gone when a little later he entered the Hux's room. The young prince was deep in thought and looked up in surprise when his guest came in. Don't you want to rest first? He asked when he saw that Iblis was already becoming interested in a roll of parchment he had in his hand. You have just had a long and tiring journey. Iblis's plan, however, was to make a good impression on the prince. He said that there was nothing he wanted more than to begin straight away to share the prince's studies and search for knowledge. Very soon, the two young men were talking earnestly about what it was the prince was studying. Time passed. Every day, Iblis and the Huck Poured over books and maps. They read the writings of wise men and talked with scholars from many countries who visited the royal palace from time to time. They also walked together in the palace gardens where the jasmine gave off its heavy scent and gazed deep in thought into the rippling surface of the pool where the golden carp swam. Dahak enjoyed these days, but at the same time he began to feel rather uneasy. Who was this Iblis, who seemed to know more than any other scholar, and who sometimes appeared to be able to read his most secret thoughts? He had said that he had come to gain knowledge, but anyone could see that he already knew more than all the wise men put together. Dahak wanted more than anything else in the world to be equal to Iblis in knowledge, and so he studied harder than ever. But one day, it seemed that at last his brain could take in no more. Disappointed, he hid his face in his hand. He no longer noticed the beauty of the flowers around him, which had so delighted him before. Iblis, what must I do to know as much as you? The young prince asked with a sigh, looking at the young scholar. 
he did not notice the strange gleam that appeared in Iblis's eyes when he asked this question, nor did he see that Iblis smiled just a little when he answered. Is that all you are worried about? Then there is no need for you to get upset. You can know just as much as you want to know. All the knowledge in the world can be yours. But on one condition, you must do exactly what I tell you. Only then can your dearest wish be fulfilled. And only then will you become the mightiest king in the world. The Huck could not believe his ears. Could what Iblis had said really be true? Would he just by doing what Iblis told him be given so much knowledge and power that no one on earth could match him? Iblis' eyes were now burning and glowing like coals. It was as if the Huck was forced to go on staring into them against his will. But in his heart, the Huck now wanted power more than anything else. He wanted it so badly that he was willing to do anything, even if he knew it was wrong. I will do what you want, please, the young prince said. If you can prove to me that all of what you have just said is true, then Iblis told him who he really was. The Huck shuddered when he heard this, but at the same time, it made him happy because he knew the demon could do what he promised. Strange days followed when Iblis' power over the heart and mind of the Huck grew stronger and stronger, and the prince came more and more under his spell. He had an idea that Iblis Although he was so friendly and charming and polite, had some evil plan. But it was too late for the Huck to get out of the bargain he had made. One night, when dark clouds were scudding across the sky and the pale moonlight flickered in strange patterns on the wall opposite the window, Iblis came into the Huck's room. The hour has come, the Huck, he said. It is time for you to become king. Your father is old, but might live for many more years yet. You must see to it that he disappears as quickly as possible. Then you can take his place on the throne and begin your reign. The Huck was very shocked at the wicked thing Iblis was asking him to do. But then he remembered the great magic power of the demon and of the promise he had made. He would have to obey. The next morning at sunrise, the Huck ordered the guards to arrest his father. He banished the old king to the wild and lonely mountains far away on the border of the country. The king, unable to defend himself against the soldiers, let himself be led away. He was full of grief and could not understand what was happening. So it was that the Huck became king. His coronation was celebrated with great pomp and splendor. There were processions of musicians and dancing girls. The army marched past with beating drums and blaring trumpets. There were fireworks at night and around the palace, the Huck's servants gave out gold pieces to the population. Long live King the Huck! shouted the crowds, the greatest king of all. From behind the curtains in his room, Iblis watched the cheering crowds and smiled. Time passed. The Huck reigned and the people were contented. But this peace did not last long, for one day 
Iblis said to the young king, Sire, it's time that you began to enjoy life more. All work and no play, as they say, makes Jack a dull boy. I know of a palace where you can forget the cares and worries of being king for a while. You can pass the days there in a manner befitting a great ruler. This made the hug curious, and he asked, Where is this palace you speak of? In the plain of K, where the roses are always in bloom, and the cypress trees reach to the cloud, answered Iblis. The Huck thought about this for a moment. The palace sounded delightful. He made up his mind to go. At that instant, Iblis clicked his fingers, and to the Huck's great amazement, a horse appeared in the palace garden before him. The animal snorted and tossed its mane and pawed the ground with its front hooves. Mount up, said Iblis to the Huck. He was scarcely in the saddle before the horse took a mighty leap into the air and soared up like an enormous dark bird into the blue sky. Along the clouds and past the sun, it went in a flowing gallop. In no time at all, the horse glided down to the plain of K, where the roses bloomed and the cypresses reached up to the sky, just as Iblis had said. Among the tall trees was a splendid palace. When the hug came closer, he saw Iblis standing at the entrance. Welcome, sire, said the demon. Welcome to the palace of forgetfulness. He led the huck through the long corridors with walls glistening and shining with silver and mother of pearl to the banqueting hall. Servants brought in dishes of the most delicious food, which Iblis offered to the young king. He ate heartily and enjoyed all of it. After the meal, they walked together in the garden, which was ablaze with flowers of all colors. How can I thank you for all this? The hug asked Iblis. The demon answered, Just let me put my head on your shoulder, sire, to show you that I am your obedient subject, then I shall be content. Astonished at these humble words, the king agreed. But Iblis' head had scarcely touched his shoulder when two horrible snakes reared up from that spot. Now you are mine, cried Iblis. He roared with laughter and disappeared that very instant. The Huck returned to his own palace in fear and despair. There, he called together all the scholars of the land. Not one of them knew any way of ridding the king of these writhing and hissing serpents. At last, the Huck ordered one of his soldiers to cut off their heads with his sword. But when this had been done, they only appeared again after a little while, even more horrible than before. Then the soldiers of the guard reported that there was an old man standing at the palace gates. He was asking to be allowed to see the king because he knew what to do about the terrible snakes. The hug ordered the guards to let him in. The old man bowed deeply and said, Greetings, King the Huck. Let me tell you what you must do about these ravenous serpents. There is only one thing that will satisfy their hunger and make them quiet. The blood of your enemies. The two snakes writhed 
and twisted and hissed more than ever at these words. And the hawk felt a searing pain in his shoulders. Obey King the hawk, came the voice of the old man. Otherwise, a pain more terrible than this will rack you for the rest of your life. Only then did the unhappy king see who the old man was. It was Iblis, most powerful of all the demons. There is no going back for you now, the Huck, he said. You must go to war. But who are my enemies? The young king asked, who was not really warlike at all. His tormentor answered, Your enemies are the cowardly warriors of King Jamshed, the tyrant who oppresses the weak and defenseless. Only when you have overthrown him can you become the mightiest ruler in the world. So the Huck prepared to destroy the army of the Persians. When the people of Arabia heard that the king was busy raising an army, there was great unrest among them. Why should we go to war? They asked one another. We are rich and happy. There is nothing we lack. The king, however, commanded that all men who were sound in wind and limb must go and enlist in the army. The women and children and the old men were left at home, weeping and lamenting day and night the misfortune that had befallen them. The Huck's army, which numbered many thousands of soldiers, soon set off for the country of King Jamshade. It marched across wide plains and over steep mountain ranges, through dried up river beds and tumbling streams. It marched on across hot, dusty deserts and through rich green meadows, through dark woods and over sunny fields, round sparkling lakes and treacherous swamps. Then one day, the high peak of Mount Dema Wind, towards which the Huck's hordes were marching, appeared on the horizon. Victory shall be ours, roared the Huck, pointing to the mountain, and he sprang into the saddle, his cloak flying in the wind behind him, while the serpents on his shoulders hissed cruelly and showed their forked tongues. Soon they would have to be satisfied. When the scouts reported to King Jamshed, that a huge army was marching towards the borders of his realm, he gathered his troops together to meet them. But his soldiers had almost forgotten how to fight, and some had even thrown their weapons away. It was so long since they had to use them. As the Huck's army came nearer, Many of them fled into the mountains to escape the battle that was about to begin. In vain, King Jamshed called on the Devi, the mysterious people he had conquered years before to help him against his enemies. The Devi were angry and astounded as that he should even dare to ask them for help after all he had done to them. They left him to his fate and returned to their strange underground kingdom. Betrayed by many of his own soldiers, abandoned by the Devi, and no longer aided by the gods, the king of the Persians went out to battle. But the battle was really lost before it began. King Dahak had a much stronger army, and with the help of Iblis, who knew many cunning tricks of war, the Arabians won a great victory. King Jamshed then fled to Mount Demavind, but Dahak followed him. When he caught up with him, he ran him through with his two-edged sword. 
and so the first part of the evil plan had been carried out as the police wanted. The Persian king was dead. Once he had been so strong and mighty, but high pride had angered the guards, and now they had punished him through the huck. The Arabian king took his palace on the throne of Persia. He began to demand the blood of the people he had conquered to satisfy the hunger of the serpents on his shoulder. When the Persians saw what sacrifices the new king was going to ask from them, panic broke out. The mothers all fled with their children to the mountains, afraid that they would be sacrificed to the terrible snakes. Very soon, King the Huck was given the nickname the Cruel. Urged on by Iblis, his deeds became more terrible and evil every day. The Persian people suffered horribly under his harsh rule. The Huck the Cruel reigned for quite a long time before the gods decided that they must end his wicked rule. So once again, they thought of a clever and roundabout way of doing this. In the city of Burzim, there lived a handsome young smith called Kawe. He was known all through the province for the excellent work he did. He made helmets and shields of iron, and the blades of many fine knives and swords gleamed in his smithy. One evening, a visitor called at the smithy. Greetings, Kawe, he said. May your life be long and blessed. The smith was surprised that the stranger knew him by name. I don't know who you are, sir, he said. How is it you know my name? Your craftsmanship has given wings to your name and carried it far and wide. The stranger answered, making the smith still more puzzled. He added, It is a pity that no one ever uses those gleaming weapons. What do you mean by that? asked the smith. The stranger replied, what I mean is that your people have suffered too long from the tyranny of a foreign ruler. Then he turned and disappeared into the shadows of the night without uttering another word. The smith, alone in his smithy, thought about these words the unknown visitor had spoken. The next morning, he made up his mind what he should do. He went to see Tamarth, the hermit, who for many years had lived alone in a hut in the mountains. He knew that the old man would know what to do and would tell him how to go about it. Greetings to you, Tamarth, he said respectfully. I need your advice. The time has come for us to rise up against our cruel king. The Persian people have suffered long enough under the Huck, the cruel, and his wicked advisor Iblis. The old man was very pleased when he heard these words. Tell as many young men as possible to come to me this evening. He said, Then I will tell them what they must do. We will soon rid our country of the evil conquerors who have plagued us for so long. Kawe hurried back to the city of Barzim. There he told all the young men he knew and met about the visit from the stranger and about his talk with the hermit. In the evening, as it grew dark, bands of young men moved towards Tamert's lonely mountain hut, growing in numbers all the time. When they were all assembled, the old man instructed them in what they must do to free themselves from the slavery and win back their independence. 
more and more men then joined them in the planned rebellion. Preparations went on for a year, and then the young men of Persia were ready to venture out against the king. Armed with weapons that Kawe and his friends had been making all this time. The young men marched to the capital for a flag they carried Kawe's leather apron. As soon as Dahak had learned that the people were rising up against him, he went to the gates of his palace. The angry snakes on his shoulder hissed viciously. At that moment, a man appeared out of nowhere in a long red cloak. He was the same stranger who had visited Kawe. Soldiers of Persia, he called out in a loud voice. You should welcome those who have come to save your country. A deathly silence fell and only the hissing of the snakes could be heard. Then there came the sound of shouts from the young Persians as they marched nearer. Before long, they were at the palace gates. The Huck turned pale. Shouting a battle cry, he rushed at Kawe, who was swinging an enormous sword. The snakes twisted themselves round the king's arms. His soldiers looked on without moving when Kawe felled the king with a mighty blow of his sword. The hated monarch crashed to the ground mortally wounded and the snakes in their last throes twined themselves around his neck. And that was how the cruel reign of the Huck was brought to an end at last. Kawe was lifted shoulder high amid loud cheers and shouts of joy and carried round the city in triumph as the hero who had set the people free. He waved his leather apron and this became a sign of the country's freedom. The people listened to Kawe's advice and made the young prince Feradun their king. He was a member of the old Persian royal family. The people of Persia feasted and celebrated for days on end and looked forward to a happy future under their new king, a future in which the Devi would be left in peace once more. Kawe, the smith, returned to his native city of Burzim, where for many years he lived happily, making weapons for the royal guard. Fortunately, those weapons did not have to be used against a foreign army. Never again, did anyone dare invade the peaceful land of Galway's countrymen? The End